Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you're having a lovely day. My apologies that I haven't been showing up here as much as usual. I had lost my voice and I also had a pretty bad fever that I just got over, so I wasn't really in the mood to talk into a camera or talk at all. Today I want to go over an article that says YouTube's plan is backfiring. People are installing better ad blockers. And in this article, it's talking about how people's behavior is changing as a result of YouTube's experiment. One of the things that I talked about in a recent video that I did is that YouTube appears to be going to war with ad ad blockers, they are showing this thing on the screen that says, if you watched more than three videos and you do not turn off your ad blocker, that they are going to disable your ability to watch videos on YouTube. And one of the rules of um, the internet tends to be don't tell the internet what to do, they will do the exact opposite. In the early days, I would tell people I was sick and tired of them calling me for repair advice for free if they didn't have a repair, and it just never stopped. People called in all the time. And then when I created videos showing people, here's exactly how to fix all your stuff for free, here's a thousand videos showing you exactly how to do it. Uh, you, so you, you know, please try and fix it yourself using all this information. Uh, don't pay me for it. People start, all these repair shops started sending me repairs and being willing to pay for it. It's just one of these things where for better or worse, on the internet, people don't listen to you. And it takes a particular type of arrogance to order these mandates and imagine that people are actually going to listen to you when it comes to stuff like this on the internet. And it seems that people are choosing to install different ad blockers or better ad blockers or try ad blockers where they had not tried ad blockers before. According to this article, Christoph Madras of Ghostery, one of the more popular ad blockers in Chrome's extension store, says they've seen three to five times the amount of installs and uninstalls over the past month, with about 90% of the users who are uninstalling it, citing the software failing on YouTube. Another ad blocker, AdGuard, said they usually see about 6,000 installations, but that shot up to 11,000 when it wasn't working. However, the paid version of the extension appears to actually be working and blocking advertisements on YouTube. And they say that their user counts increased, reaching about 60,000 on October 18th, which is a fairly high number for them in contrast to past rates. So it looks like people are not saying, okay, fine, I'll do what you're going to tell me, but they're immediately clicking off and experimenting. They're trying new things. They're trying new applications. They're trying new browsers. They're trying new extensions, and they're trying new ways to do it. And when people do videos on YouTube demonstrating different ways that you can view content and those videos get struck or taken down, it seems like people tend to do the opposite of what YouTube is asking them to do, as you can see by this little graph over here, because it seems like a video may or may not have been deleted around here against the content creator's will, and it seems like the software, um, well... I'll let the graph speak for itself over there. The point that I don't see most of these articles addressing is the larger more important point in my opinion, which is that a majority of the users of these platforms and a majority of internet users in general not only don't use an ad blocker, but don't even know what it is. Most of the people that watch this channel probably find that silly. You're probably like me. In 2001, you were using Mozilla 1.0.1 because it blocked third-party cookies and pop-ups and had tabs back when everybody else was using Internet Explorer 5 or 6 and that pop-ups and no tabs and viruses and third-party cookies and tracking and you're probably like me, you were using an ad blocker over 10 years ago. But the reality is that most people, most ordinary users, use whatever the default experience is. So if the default experience is the browser that came with the computer and that browser is filled with ads or whatever, it's the most popular one and that's filled with ads and doesn't have a pop-up blocker or whatever else, that's what they use. Most people not only don't use an ad blocker, they don't even know what it is. Don't get me wrong, if you tell them I use an ad blocker, they'll know, oh, that must be something that blocks ads. But before you say that out loud, there are hundreds of millions of people probably in the United States that legitimately just don't understand that they can install that in their browser. And for us, it's very easy to get stuck in an echo chamber and stuck in our little niche community of believing that everybody thinks like us. I just look at the stats on my own channel. I tell people I have no problem with you using Adblock. I tell people I don't think Adblock is piracy. I've showed you videos on Brave Browser and other browsers that do this by default. And an overwhelming portion of my audience still watches videos and views the ads. Not as many as other content creators with different audiences. I've compared my stats with other content creators and my ad viewership rate and CPM rate is considerably lower than theirs, but it's high enough that I know a majority of my audience does not have an ad blocker installed. So when this shows up in the news, when this shows up in Wired and The Verge and Android Authority and Front Pages Reddit and shows up in all of these major news websites, you're going to have a lot of ordinary people go, you could block ads? That's a thing? You mean that's not like compiling Gentoo Linux in 2004? I literally just have to click two or three things and it's free? Wow. 
And that's the way I think that this is genuinely going to backfire on YouTube. Not just the fact that you're going to get people to use different ad blockers rather than listen to you, but rather that in the large majority of your audience that had just kind of been sitting there silent, that didn't really even know what an ad blocker is, is now going to be woken up into realizing that they exist and that they can use them. There is something called the Streisand effect. When you try to delete something from history or you try to delete it from view, it tends to be viewed more often. And more importantly, when you try to tell people what to do as a mandate, they tend to do the opposite. It's, it's, just, it's one of those things that doesn't seem to work out very well. And I think the reason that people are pushing back against all of this is because they're realizing that the ad support and internet fundamentally sucks in many different ways. This article from Wired says that Matthew Meyer, who oversees IO's ad blockers, says that surveys show that most users are not against ads entirely, but they're frustrated with ads that are intrusive, too numerous, or longer than six seconds without a skip option. Where the issue comes in is when they feel the line is overstepped. For instance, like I actually at one point in time paid for Bloomberg News. That's $40 a month for Bloomberg News. And when I would use their website, I would go to play a video and there would be an ad in the video. I'm giving you $40 a month. What in God's name makes you believe that you are entitled to give me an ad at that point and that I will still pay you? You are absolutely out of your mind and insane. Not only am I going to stop paying you, but I am also going to view use an ad blocker and a paywall blocker to access your content because what you've done, in my opinion, crosses a moral and ethical line. That's just a, that's a shit way to treat your customers. And people are starting to recognize this. Even when it comes to product comparisons nowadays, I remember when the internet used to be a place where I could just get actual information from real world humans, and that just doesn't seem to be the case anymore. When I Google or try to find product comparisons, I don't find people talking about them anymore. I find garbage websites like this where I can't tell if this was generated by ChatGPT or somebody in a third world country making a dollar a day to copy and paste specifications from a website. This is, in my opinion, I don't want to attack them, but kind of a useless website that is designed to drive traffic to Amazon via affiliate links so that they can make money off of affiliate links while providing the bare minimum information necessary to get a first page Google ranking so that Google thinks that this is actually a useful page when it is completely devoid of any human content. This is a problem with the modern internet. The content that rises to the top nowadays as everybody seeks out more ad revenue is not content that is actually useful to the end user, but rather it is content that is going to get the most clicks, whether by hook or or by crook. When it comes to YouTube, content like the content that Jessa Jones, Afrotech Mods, EEV Blog, STS Telecom, Tim Herman at TCR Circuit, Jesse Cruz, all these people that make amazing content that teaches you how to do very difficult repairs in an interesting and engaging way, is content that people, in my opinion, would be willing to pay for. This is content where they learn something genuinely useful. People would pay for that content, but it has a lower viewership than tech racks throwing a phone down a staircase or lighting bugs on fire. As a result, that content that nobody in their right mind is willing to pay for, but that can get the most clicks because it will give you a cheap laugh or because it is sensational or because it will make you angry is the content that does the best. And the content that gets the most viewership, regardless of its actual value, in an ad supported marketplace is the content that rises to the top, which is why I am more than happy to accept the label of, quote, extremist if being anti-advertising makes me extremist. In my opinion, the advertiser-supported internet is reaching that late stage where the content that rises to the top is not the best content, but in many cases is simply the content that will make you the angriest or give you a cheap laugh, and is not necessarily the content that is even healthy for you to be consuming. But that's what we are encouraging when we use that, which is why as a creator that has almost 2 million subscribers, where over 99% of my revenue on YouTube is ad revenue, I have no problem with using Adblock. Not only do I have no problem with using Adblock, but I encourage you to use Adblock because I don't think we're encouraging a better internet the way that we are doing it right now. I stand by my assertion that I genuinely believe that YouTube is not a profitable company and that the reason that they are doing this is because they are looking for pennies in the couch at this point because they've run out of ways to try and raise revenue and decrease expenses so that they can actually make more money. I genuinely believe that the advertiser supported internet in many ways is not even financially viable and only even worked because it was fueled by investor money, fueled by rock bottom interest rates over the past 15 years that are going away. And I would strongly suggest that creators consider alternative streams of revenue when they're providing value to their audience if you want to do this as a full-time job. I don't do YouTube as a full-time job, but if I did, I would look for every single way possible to avoid this. I would listen to the feedback that I was getting 
getting from my users that they genuinely despise advertisements. And I would also provide them honest feedback myself, which is I am putting a full time level of effort into this. Life is very expensive now. How do you want if, if you genuinely find this valuable? What do you think we can do to make this work? Yes, I make YouTube content. and I put up a good amount of time into making YouTube content, but I, I don't have it in me to bullshit you. I use an ad blocker like on my own computer for me to tell you to not use an ad blocker when I use an ad blocker because I find ads to be annoying would be the most hypocritical thing imaginable given how much that I hate ads. I don't have it in me to do that to you when I tell you that I find ads annoying. When I show you my screen with LibreWolf installed with uBlock Origin or Brave Browser with privacy filters turned on and then I tell you you shouldn't use ad block because that's piracy. It just it comes off as so hypocritical knowing that that is not what I'm doing. I send money to the creators that have created content that I find to be valuable and I support them in every which way that I can. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to tell you to not use an ad blocker when I personally find ads annoying myself. And I think that YouTube is putting themselves in for a very interesting war here with the ad blockers because A, the internet is going to find a way to get around the ads if they really want to. And more importantly, I think that they are going to really mess with the embedded devices, many of them that are using applications that are not going to be updated on older Android devices, Fire TV, Smart TVs, and everything else that have a YouTube app built in. How many of those devices are going to have their internal YouTube app and functionality broken if YouTube implements enough stuff to try to get around ad blockers? YouTube is very limited in what they can do here because they want the maximum amount of viewership on the maximum amount of devices possible, which can break if they try to put in all this extra shit to try to detect if you're using an ad blocker. As someone who still makes money from YouTube ad revenue, I still genuinely believe that we would be better supported and we'd have a better community as a whole with a different model. And it's I think it's going to be incumbent on us to figure it out. I think what Google and many other companies did in the early 2000s is they listened to us bicker back and forth on how a world-class music album from our favorite musician was not worth $15 because $15 for a CD was a rip off, but they realized the same people that would call $15 for a world-class album a ripoff were willing to spend 3 to $4 at Starbucks every day for the shittiest coffee I've ever tasted in my life. And they thought, okay, nobody's willing to pay for this. What else can we do? And I, I honestly think that this all started going downhill with Gmail in 2004. They realized that as long as we give you one gigabyte of free storage and a fast client that we can literally go through all of your emails and advertise to you based on your most personal communications and everybody's okay with it. We we set the stage for this by saying no to paying for things at every step of the way, but being more than happy to pay with our privacy and our information. And as much as we hate the advertiser world that we live in right now, I think it's incumbent on us as users, viewers, and consumers to take a really harsh look in the mirror and understand that we have a place in the internet of today that we live in, which is ver completely advertiser supported based on our behavior over the past 25 years. I think we have sent the message that we are not willing to pay for anything, but again, give me a gigabyte of free storage and I'll let you have access to every personal conversation I've ever had for the purpose of advertising to me. The honest to God red pill is that there isn't some sort of crazy conspiracy, but rather that the world is the way it is because of us. And uh, if we want this to change, we are going to have to be a part of that change and we are going to have to come up with better models. And I am committed to coming up with better models and I am committed to being a part of that change so that the type of asshole that gave the speech that he did at this conference does not get the world that he wants, but we get the world that we want. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. The more you create these type of mandates and dictates and try to tell people what to do, the more they're going to swing in the other direction. It doesn't work that way. I could scream until I'm blue in the face that I don't want you to call me with free rep asking for free repair advice. I'm going to get 180 calls a day asking for free repair advice. I put up all the free information online to show people how to do it themselves. They wind up sending it to me without reading any of the information anyway. You can't get the internet to do what you want. It's not how it works. I'll see you in the next video. Bye now. Before we end the video, we're going to have a word from our anti-sponsor. Not sponsor. I hear you people with sponsor block are out to put a timestamp somewhere. Anti-sponsor. What I wanted to do is I wanted to give you some insight into why I believe small businesses and large businesses alike should avoid Inuit QuickBooks at all costs. Inuit QuickBooks is kind of like DigiDesign Pro Tools back in the day where they made good software that did something that other software vendors were not providing. And then at some point they realized that they had industry dominance because they were the standard. And once they realized that, they stopped caring about creating good software or good hardware. And I feel like Inuit's been doing that for at least a decade now. There are some basic features and functionality that 
that they have that in my opinion they haven't put any effort into making it not buggy or actually work for a really long period of time. So one of the features they have is this receipt recognition thing where you can upload or scan all of your receipts and then it will match those receipts to the expenses in your bank account. This is very useful particularly if you're somebody that gets audited all the time because you won't have to look up your receipts manually. Instead of like having to look up a receipt when somebody says, okay, prove that this expense was real. Prove that you bought this Samsung S3 phone for a data recovery job. Or prove that this $200 was spent on this. And then having to look it up, you can literally give them access to the account and say, every expense in my bank account has a receipt attached to it that explains exactly what it is for. And it makes the process of going through audits a lot easier. I can save that from experience. And having to match each individual receipt to each individual expense manually can be a bit of a pain in the ass. So the feature and functionality whereby it will look through all of your receipts, so look at the date, and then look at the price and actually match it with an expense is cool. The problem is that this feature doesn't work. But more importantly, not just that this feature doesn't work or it works less than 20% of the time, the entire system that they use for storing these receipts is fundamentally broken in a way that's very concerning when you consider that what Inuit is selling you is a product that is going to be managing numbers. You're trusting the program with numbers when it fundamentally cannot get some of the very, very basics right. And it really does make me wonder how stupid I am for continuing to use this and not making it an immediate priority to migrate to something else rather than just use it because it was a software that my accountant told me to use when I started using him 13 years ago. So one of the features of QuickBooks is that you can upload receipts and when you upload the receipt, if the software is working as it's supposed to, which it never does, it will actually read the content of those receipts and then will automatically match it to your transaction. And one thing you can see here is that it has done that for for none of them. It'll, so if I have a page with 20 transactions, the receipt matching feature will work for one of them. Now, sometimes people will say, well, maybe the handwriting was bad on the receipt if it was something where you left a tip, or maybe the receipt wasn't printed well. And here, in this case, what I do is I actually have all of my employees make all of their orders to a single email account, and then I export every single one of the emails as a PDF, and then I upload it to QuickBooks. So I just wanted to show you how this can work. So sometimes when it doesn't work, I'll re-upload it, and there'll be duplicates. And I just wanted to give you, show you a little bit of how buggy this is. So I'm deleting all of the receipts so that I can start fresh. And as you can see here, it says I have 744 uploaded in the bottom corner. Now, if I click over here on this, it looks like it's selected 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So 10 are selected. Back to what I was talking about before with buggy random crap. So before it probably showed like 500 to 700 receipts here and I was slowly deleting them all until I got to zero. Now once you get to zero, watch this. I'm going to go over and I'm gonna refresh the page and you're gonna see a typical thing of any sort of Intuit buggy garbage software. When I click reload on the receipts tab, you will think that I have deleted all of the receipts. However, I have not. The first thing you'll notice is that it's going to take forever to load because it is a piece of Intuit software. The second thing you'll notice is that when I scroll all the way down over here, not only do I not have zero receipts, but I have 2,109, which is more than I even had before I started this exercise of clicking on to delete everything. So watch this. I'm going to delete 10 transactions. Next up, I'm going to click here. I'm going to go batch. And so, so it said I had 2,109, right? Now it says 1 to 10 of 10. So deleting 10, so 2,109 minus 10 in Intuit math equals 10. And if you're, again, if you're trusting these people with your accounting or your records when they can't do basic math on page, on like list counts, uh, I'm afraid for you. Now, again, see how I got to zero? But watch this. There's more. You click refresh, and after you click refresh, again, it will take forever because this is a piece of Intuit software. And once you have clicked refresh, it'll, it's, again, it's, it's going to take a while. And you scroll down over here, and the, you'll see a few things. The first is that some of the pieces that I deleted are actually still there again. So they're not actually deleting. They are still there. Those emails are there. And secondly, it says I have 2,089 again. So let's say I go over here. I'm going to delete these 10. I'm deleting 10 from a list of 2,089. And again, you'll notice that I'm back at 10 receipts. And then I click here, and then I go delete selected. I will eventually get to zero. However, if I refresh again, the same thing will happen. And again, the reason I'm doing this is if I go to bank transactions, some of them show up, but others do not. So for instance, Granger, 
an email with office crap I bought from Granger will show up. Stuff I bought from Protect Restore. When I click over here, it matches it to the PDF that had all the information on that sale because it sees this is an order for $1,222.90 and it finds that I have an email that just so happens to be for $1,222.90. It's recognizing that that number exists in the email and it suggests in the PDF match, which is what it's supposed to do. However, for many other sales, it does not do that. For this eBay sale, which I guarantee is in one of those PDFs, it is not there. This Protect Restore one is not there. This eBay one is, this eBay one is not, this Protect Restore one is not, this eBay one is not. So some receipts show will, will sync properly and other receipts will not. So the reason that I'm doing this purge is because there are a lot of receipts that are not showing up and what I've read online is that sometimes if there are, if or it sees duplicates, it will not recognize them. So I'm tr go doing what was suggested online, which is purging my receipt count. And again, the problem with purging your receipt count is when you're using a piece of software this buggy, 2109 minus 10 equals 10 in QuickBooks world. So how do you delete all of these? I don't know. And will this ever work? I have no idea. And will you ever be able to contact Intuit support to figure it out? Good luck with that. I've tried contacting Intuit support many times over the past 13 years. That is not a thing. So what is my goal with this video? What is the point of it? My point is as follows. Once you get started into an ecosystem like QuickBooks, if you have numerous forms of revenue like I do, you have a web forum, you have a Magento store, you have an in-store system where with a POS system and all of this, you have a, a system for payroll, it can be very difficult to migrate to a new system, particularly if your accountant uses this one, particularly for somebody like me who has two, I mean, two New York for-profit businesses that he's closing, to Texas for-profit businesses that he's using, to nonprofits and a full-time job, it can be very difficult to start from scratch, especially if your accountant is used to using this particular software. My goal is to get as many people as possible to not make the mistake that I made of hooking themselves into poorly supported buggy software like QuickBooks simply because it is the industry standard to begin with. If you start a session in Pro Tools and it is very complicated, it's going to be difficult to switch over to a program like Logic or Nuendo later. But if you start out your session in Logic and Nuendo, it'll be very easy, if, even if you have to deal with a learning curve. And I'm suggesting that all of you deal with that learning curve of using other software up front rather than simply using what your CPA recommends because he is used to it, because it really will cost you a lot of time and aggravation and hassle later on when basic features and functionality don't work and there's no way to get support for them because the software and the company behind it is it just doesn't care. Again, Intuit is going to continue to make money off of legacy customers that are using it because their accounting firms and CPAs are used to it the same way that Pro Tools was going to continue making money and forcing people to use garbage like the Mbox and the DigiDesign 002 back in the day, even though they were garbage interfaces because of the sheer number of people that were using it as a result of it being the industry standard. It actually gets better if you continue. So right now I've been going through and deleting stuff, matching stuff manually that I found that I could match manually before the purging entirely and 1,846 receipts. I'm on page 61 to 70 here, so I'm on page six of many pages. Now you click next, and there's no sign that it's loading or it's trying to load it, or that these, there, you know, these receipts may not be here because of an error. It's literally just nothing. You click next again, and again, the, like, is there anything there or is there not? I don't know. You click next again, and this is the funny part. So 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90 were not there, but 90 to 100 were there. So it doesn't even have the... It, uh, it's almost like I'm making an array in C, and like I've filled up 0 through 10, and then I filled up 60 through 70, but I didn't fill up like 11 through 20, 21 through 30, 31 through 40. This is almost as bad, if not worse, than the GitHub I have, where I'm going through Dennis Ritchie's C programming language exercises, and I'm messing up on chapter one. I'm actually saving all the ones where I mess up. If I if I mess up, what I do is I create a new file, and then I say, here, I solved it, so I can see my progress as I learn and as I stop being an, an idiot and kind of get better at it as time goes on. But this really does remind me of like some of the software that I was trying to produce when I was following Dennis Ritchie's C programming language book, chapter one, and was failing in the very beginning because I had no idea what I was doing, except this is a multi-billion dollar company that's doing the same thing, which makes it absolutely hysterical. After an hour of following the advice that I saw on one of their support forums, which is to delete all the existing receipts, I managed to actually go through and delete every existing receipt. What I did was I opened up 
about 200 pages because there were about 2,100 receipts. Uh, there's 10 receipts per page. So I opened up 2,100 pages and I had this browser tab is on page one, this browser tab page two, this browser tab page three. And then I clicked all and I hit delete. And then I re-uploaded some receipts and less than 10% of the receipts that I uploaded were actually able to be matched because the thing that reads through the receipt, even when it's a PDF with selectable text and everything else, it is completely incapable of actually matching anything, which is, yeah, yeah. Inuit. Inuit software. 14 years into using it, it still works like shit. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something.